Since time began, man has always wanted to record what he sees and then transmit the image to a wider audience in order to tell or share his story with others. Later, as the need came to communicate far and wide, methods of copying images in striking colors were put into place. Thousands of hours were spent meticulously bringing about the images in magnificent colors and then sending them off to others. From this early low-tech approach to image reproduction, the challenge became using new technologies for copying images, always striving for more speed and even higher quality, although those images painstakingly reproduced at the hands of hundreds of monks would be hard to beat. It was Asia where the first wooden blocks carved for printing would be born, followed by the publication of the Diamond Sutra in Korea in 868. But by 1241, Korea would be in the game with movable type. From here, inventors across the globe would take up the race to come up with a new app that would take the world by storm and with it reach the holy grail of picture reproduction. With the arrival of paper in the 1300s, new ways to show words and images would soon arrive. Gutenberg would capitalize on his printing press, thus bringing the world into a new age. Pictures would soon be worth a thousand words. Again, image reproduction would take a leap with the arrival of personal photography at the start of the 19th century. And while people would still only take one treasured shot with their brownies, it would not be long before those images could be copied, and more importantly, shared. New industries were born. Cinematography, medical radiology and x-rays. And the space race was on. Remote sensing brought the first images to Earth from outer space. It was hard to tell which feat was more remarkable, sending a man to the moon or having his image show up in your living room. And so it was, at the dawn of the computer age, researchers, companies and individuals started thinking about how to bring more images onto your screen. It started with the Europeans, who began bringing out various models of video text combining computers, text and images, trailblazing the way to image coding and realistic representations of our world. But in a computer lab in California, someone else was coding away busily breaking those digital images down into translatable, transmittable, and totally reproducible pictures. Round about the same time, camera makers were putting megapixels into the palm of your hand. By 1981, we would have Asia to thank again by way of Sonicor for its release of the Mavica, the magnetic video camera the world's first commercial electronic camera. So now, we had the user-friendly cameras, we had the video screens, but the elusive question remained. How to reproduce these images electronically so that people would want to view them? It all boiled down to two things, technology and image quality. So 2013 is the 20th anniversary of JPEG. Now, it's, it's an interesting thing because uh, when we say JPEG, almost everybody knows about what it is. So in a way, we all have the impression we know what is JPEG because all of us, not only we consume, we produce JPEG images, we always wear some devices like laptops, we have with us uh, smartphones, uh, we have with us computers and they all have actually a JPEG enabled uh, algorithm in them. In fact, most of us, I can even say today, we have at least two, if not even three, JPEG engines in our body, either in our smartphone or in our tablets, etc. I don't want to uh, give the impression that I'm exaggerating, but I think there is an alert that has not one way or another touched some JPEG image. But what were the needs in those days, other than just expecting that everything will be digital? In those days, uh, we didn't have um, 
internet. We didn't have Facebook or uh, or Instagram and alike. Uh, we only had digital telephone lines. We had television uh, uh, channels, and that was it basically. Radio, maybe, uh, and that's it. Um, in those days, people had one interest, and this was um, to be able to send just some text and graphics through some terminals. Uh, several million users of this technology that was like a telephone. You would hook it into your telephone line, and this would allow you to ask questions uh, by entering some text and get some, uh, some answers about uh, what were the movies that were on uh, in theaters, in Paris, uh, or what was the telephone number and address of a restaurant, etc., etc. Things that we actually are now very familiar with because, and thanks to the internet. One thing that was missing was that a uh, Minitel technology and a lot of technologies that were similar to that in those days, they could, of course, um, do a good job if you were only having communication based on text. But if you wanted to send and receive images, there was nothing around. The pictures don't really have any value if they cannot be communicated, if they cannot be uh, consumed in a seamless way all over the world. No matter where you are, no matter which device you have used to create it or which device you have used to, to consume it and to visualize it. It was clear that this had to be an international standard. Various groups across the globe were working away, led by the telecoms companies, trying to code and compress digital images. It was 1982 and the Joint Photographic Expert Group, JPEG for short, was about to be formed. Initially, the group set its sights on developing a wholly international digital image standard, one that could be used across continents, companies and communications networks. Before long, the JPEG standard would be more than just a gleam in their eyes. JPEG would be born, eventually to become a household name. Talking about the JPEG committee, uh, there are um many type of people with many different type of interests and background that, uh, that come to these meetings. Uh, it's in a way a melting pot of people with very, very different expertise in, their, in different fields uh, and also very multicultural because you have people, those who are going to these um, standardization committees, they are the best of the, the cream of the cream. The group was created um, some 20-some uh, years ago, uh, around 25 years ago. And of course, because it was international, it was composed of uh, many uh, actors uh, from many places in the world. North America, obviously, uh, Asia, mainly Japan in those days, and uh, of course, a lot of European actors. But there also, it's uh, easier said than done. In order to come up with a very good uh, evaluation protocol, you have to be sure that you are going to be both reliable and reproducible. So based on these, uh, these criteria, the evaluation methodologies that was, that was selected was actually as follows. Uh, you would compress uh, different material, different content that was also selected very carefully. Um, using different algorithms that were proposed to become the potential JPEG standard. And you ask them to which one has a better quality. Quite a, quite a lot of uh, hard work in terms of uh, evaluation. It turned out that uh, one technology is actually um, getting results that are far superior than any others. And the winner was based on a mathematical concept called DCT, otherwise discrete cosine transform. And then for a few years following that, the experts tried to come up with a complete algorithm, uh, test it, evaluate it, make sure it has the right level of complexity, even improve upon what was proposed, and this gave birth to uh, the JPEG uh, uh, standard. JPEG was the perfect answer to everyone's needs. It's a technology that even after 20 years is still growing strong with more and more images being taken, 
shared, and more and more applications delivering what we always wanted, the ability to take and share images across the globe. And this is one of the few technologies that are more than 20 years old, but they are still growing on a daily basis. The most recent cameras, uh, the most recent mobile phones, they all still are using the JPEG standard. And this is uh, uh, the reason of the very nice design and the very nice compromise between the compression efficiency, how compress, how much you can compress the data while keeping its quality very high, versus the complexity. If you ask me the question, is JPEG going to die one day? Well, of course, but I don't think this is going to be tomorrow. I think JPEG format is here to stay for probably a couple of more decades, if not more. JPEG, no matter how successful it has been, has had a few difficulties in a few special areas of applications. In medical imaging, doctors need to do diagnosis by looking at the um, pictures of uh, X-rays, MRI. JPEG is, by definition, a lossy compression. It means that it actually creates some loss when you compress the content. Well, you can imagine how a doctor, and even worse, a patient, would feel if you say, I took a picture of your chest to see if you have some uh, heart problem, but in fact, in order to be able to, uh, to visualize it, I destroyed part of the content. And now, well, there is a chance, no matter how little, that my diagnosis may be affected by this loss. Now, JPEG 2000, compared to JPEG standard, uh, uh, not only uh, makes a better uh, compression efficiency for the same quality, or the quality is higher for the same compression efficiency, but it brings also a few features such as lossless coding, additional features like scalable, very efficient scalable uh, coding. Here we are, 2013. Do we need beyond JPEG and JPEG 2000 standards, any other standard um, uh, file format? The answer is again, yes. One has to see where the world is going from today, 2013, into the future. Let me give you an example. We all have a lot of JPEG engines around us, and so on has um, a, obviously a JPEG engine, a camera that can take pictures. Now, one thing that uh, most people don't know is that uh, the advanced cameras uh, in mobile phones and even uh, digital still cameras, they all have a mode called high dynamic range. High dynamic range it helps uh, bathographers like me who always make uh, either uh, underexposed or overexposed pictures that are either too dark or too bright uh, to not to have this problem. Uh, however, the high dynamic range images that are created with these cameras, they cannot be stored in a high dynamic range format. So when you create a high dynamic range image, your camera actually has to convert it into something that is not anymore high dynamic range and store it. So there is a need today, a very, very serious need for these cameras to be able to store high dynamic range images. And this is where JPEG is going. In fact, as we talk today, JPEG is working towards a standard that will be uh, for compression of high dynamic range images. One problem we all are facing, thanks or because of the internet, is that a lot of people are producing a lot of pictures and these pictures are either scattered on our disks or they are all over the internet. Also, even putting some order, managing these pictures, uh, retrieving the pictures we like to have, is an issue. This is a challenge that uh, JPEG Committee has actually been uh, taking dear to its heart and since a few years has been working on it. The project is called JP Search. It helps uh, those who have the problem of what is called shoebox, uh, which means the, in the old days you used to put all your pictures in a shoebox. 
and then it's very difficult to, to browse through them. You could turn your digital shoebox, which is nowadays your hard disk, into something very, very manageable. It's a technology that has been already standardized and is uh, at disposition of those who want to use it.